Well, we are on continuing in our series, A Biblical Worldview. This is sermon number nine on the biblical worldview. We're going to finish up next week with the last one in the series. This morning we're talking about biblical joy in Christ versus worldly happiness. Biblical joy in Christ versus worldly happiness. Depending on your outlook on life, you may tend to seek happiness and mistake it for joy. The Bible has a very different understanding of joy and happiness. Most theologians believe we're going to be in Psalm 100, is our text this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 100. Most theologians believe Psalm 100 is a song of worship, praise, and thanksgiving as the Israelites were making their way into the temple. As we explore Psalm 100 this morning, please notice it is a universal psalm, meaning it is not just for the nation of Israel, but for all of mankind. Biblical joy in Christ is a heart thing. Biblical joy in Christ is a heart thing. Our thesis this morning, again, is biblical joy in Christ versus happiness. Please remember our, our definition of a biblical worldview. I've said it every Sunday. Well, I'll say it again next Sunday. A biblical worldview is completely and absolutely anchored in the teachings of the Word of God, the Bible. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, are to live our life as best we can, understanding that the things that we do in our life, we need to move through the pages of Scripture to, make, to, to allow us to walk in a Christian, biblical way. The illustration that we've been using the last nine weeks, we're going to do it again, the last eight weeks, we're going to do it again this morning. I have some green, pe green peas. The green peas represents the world. Golden flower represents our biblical worldview, our, our Bible. And as we live our life in this world, we are to sift through the nonsense, through the pages of Scripture. That is how we live a biblical worldview. This morning, would you please welcome Brother David McNeil to the podium to read Psalm 100. Come on up, brother. joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Excellent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we spend the next few minutes looking at biblical joy in the happiness of the world, I do pray, Heavenly Father, that none of us leave here the same as we walked in because we heard from you this morning. Help us to understand, Heavenly Father, that the joy that we have, the joy that was from within, can only come from the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, Heavenly Father, as we take a few minutes to understand this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first off, we're going to look at what is happiness. What is happiness? That's the question. I, I told you when I first came here a long time ago, I'm that guy that always asks the why questions. If you have little children or grandchildren, they're always asking why this, why that, why this, why that. I was that guy. So the question that I asked is, what is worldly happiness? So according to another website for you, okay, another website for you, 
And these are interesting because this is what the world believes, guys. That's why I give them to you. So you can go to it for yourself. Don't take my word for it, no matter what I say. It has to come from the word of God. Go, for, go to it for yourself. www.verywellminded.com www.verywellminded.com says this. This website starts with self-improvement. What does happiness really mean? It is not the same for everyone. It continues. Happiness is something that people seek to find. Yet, what defines happiness can vary from one person to the next. Typically, happiness is an emotional state characterized by feelings of joy, satisfaction, contentment, and fulfillment. While happiness has many different definitions, it is often described as involving positive emotions in life satisfaction. Another definition of happiness comes from the ancient philosopher Aristotle, who suggested that happiness is one human desire and all other human desires exist as a way to obtain happiness. He believed that there were four levels of happiness. Happiness from immediate gratification, from comparison and achievement, from making positive contributions, and from achieving fulfillment. Whatever fulfillment is. Based on what I just said, many people confuse biblical joy and happiness. Now, I, I know I've read this quote to you before, last year, two years ago, or whatever, but it's the best quote that I could find, and it's from uh, Dr. Tony Evans. He describes joy and happiness like this. Joy. Joy comes from the inside. Joy can be defined as an inner sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, or, fu or fullness of life, irrespective of circumstances. It does not mean there is an absence of pain. To put it differently, joy is an inward state of being that determines a person's outward response to the situation. To the situation. Why? Because it comes from the inside. He further says about happiness. Happiness comes from the outside. Happiness can be defined as a positive emotional response a person experiences because favorable life because of a favorable life situation. In other words, happiness depends on outward circumstances to determine an inward state of mind. An outward circumstances to determine your inward state of mind. See how backwards that is? Let's go on. Psalm chapter, Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Shouting for joy to the Lord is a very emotional reaction. Please understand, your circumstances should not dictate your joy or level of your joy. Your circumstances should not dictate the level of your joy. Notice in verse 1, all the earth shouts for joy. Just like salvation, all of the earth will be shouting for joy on that day when we see Jesus. Now, some won't be shouting for joy. Some will be running because they made the wrong decision. We're going to talk about that. The Lord wants his worshipers to come before him with thanksgiving, with joyful songs. He wants us to sing out loud. He wants us to come it, remember, it's an inner thing. Having a Christ-centered biblical joy is true satisfaction. Satisfaction. Many times in the Bible, the Lord illustrates joy. Now, it's very interesting. In the Bible, the Lord illustrates joy as full or complete. As full or complete. Therefore, biblical joy satisfies the heart in a way that temporary things of this world cannot do. It cannot do. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Let me just take you all back to the day 
that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Do you know what song comes to mind? Oh, happy day. Every one of us, when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter where we were, there were some people who accept Jesus Christ in the bottom of a jail cell, in darkness, in a cave. And when they receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit indwells them, there is a joy, an unexplainable, explicit joy that every one of us who are Christians experience. The problem with us old folk is we forget about that sometimes. We forget about the joy in the Lord. Sometimes we have to be prompted by our worship. But I pose to you to start really thinking about the joy. And if you have to go all the way back to when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now I know I'm different. I do. I'm one of those guys who are just wild. But everyone expressed joy when you accepted Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. We are like-minded, being one in spirit and in purpose. Most of you know, I cannot sing. I cannot carry a note in a bucket. But that is no excuse for me not to praise and worship the Lord Jesus Christ in gladness and joyfulness. There's no excuse. Your voice has nothing to do with your joy. It doesn't. Biblical joy is a heart thing. Not a sound or melody thing. It is not a sound or a melody thing. Biblical joy is a heart thing. That is what I hang my hat on. Because I know I can't sing. There's only now, we have 15 grandchildren. We have, I think, the youngest five believe I can sing. The older ten know that granddaddy can't carry a note. But I do what the Bible says. Let me share that with you. Psalm, 89, eight, Psalm 98, 4. Psalm 98, 4. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth, make a, no, a loud noise, a loud noise. And, jo- and rejoice and sing praises. How about another one? Psalm 95, 1. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord, to to the rock of our salvation. Make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 28, verses 7 and 8 says this. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of my people, the fortress of myself, the fortress of salvation, for he anoint from, from, for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Can I give you a real life example of this? As many of you know, one day a week, I still see a couple of patients in the hospice world. And on Friday, my very last visit is about 2.30. Because of confidentiality, I can't tell you anything about the person. I'm only going to give you what happened. This sister was a missionary. I walked into her room and she has an oxygen mask on. She had a family member beside her, and they were doing some things with the yarn. And she was joyful. This sister was joyful. I walked in, and she said, Rev. I said, hey, girl. 
And she said, praise the Lord, you're here. And we just got 20 minute, 20 minute visit goes like that. She started talking. The person that was in the room with her was telling her, telling me about her ministry and what the Lord had done through her. Now this person is in her late 80s on hospice. And she had the joy of the Lord. Incredible. So a joy of the Lord has nothing to do with how you look and feel physically. Remember, we always forget what Scripture says. Our bodies are breaking down every day. We don't remember that text until we're in our 70s. For me, I remember that text in my 50s. When I had to have my first operation, I was like, wow, that, that really is true. Your joy is an inside job. Our joy comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. The founder of Ministries for Charity. Remember Mother Teresa? Remember her, many of you? You young folks, I want you to Google her name. She was an Albanian, Indian-born Catholic nun. She had a definition for joy. You know what it was? Really cool. Joy is strength. Joy is strength. And when you young people Google Mother Teresa, you're going to see that she was a little bitty thing. Girlfriend was like 5'2", maybe weighed 100 pounds, on the streets of Calcutta, praying and feeding the hungry and sharing Christ. Joy is an inside job. Let's look at verse 3. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and, he, and, we are his, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The Lord God here in the Hebrew is translated Yahweh is, is Elam, Elohim. Yahweh is Elohim. This is important to understand because God reveals his covenant relationship with his people, Elohim. His covenant relationship with us. Elohim reveals the power and the authority of God in his creation. The power and the authority of his creation. Elohim. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7 says this. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are his people of his pasture, the flock under his care. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become part of the flock, and our shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are under his care. Psalm, 90, Psalm 79, 13 says this, Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Had an interesting conversation this morning with Roman. I have a 40-gallon 40 40 fish tank in, a, in a, our family room. And we were getting ready to get out the door. Many of you who raise kids know getting out the door with kids is a task and a half. Because everything gets stopped. So here I have my phone in my pocket. I've got everything going. Michelle's got the backpacks on the kids. And Roman walks over and says, Hey, Granddaddy, there's a rainbow in the fish tank. And Michelle walked over and she says, Oh, you're right. And he says, A pot of gold, Granddaddy. And I said, Oh, no. Oh, no, Roman. Do you know where the rainbow came from? And he said, Well, what's in the pot of gold? I said, No. No. A rainbow is God telling us. Every time you see one now, grandson, I want you to think that God is saying, I remember I'm not going to destroy the earth by water. And I'll read you the story when we come home. But what happened was 
The rainbow was God telling man that I remember that I'm not going to destroy the world by water. Every time you see one, that's what it means. He goes, really? I said, yes. The world has made it something else. But now, grandson, every time you see a rainbow, that's what it means. It comes from the Bible. Generation to generation. That is a small illustration of how we can talk to our children, our grandchildren, the neighbor's kids. When Lord puts you in that situation and you know that something is not something that the world has made up, in the way that you are, you can put that biblical nugget there and leave it. It's like dropping the mic and walking away. Generation to generation. There is an ever-present joy of the Lord found throughout the Old and New Testament. This fullness of biblical joy can only be found in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It can only be found in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 14, verses 17 and 18 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by man. Approved by men. Psalm 16, verse 11 says this, You have... You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Only the Lord can give us Christ-centered biblical joy, and it comes through the Holy Spirit. In the last part of these three verses, we are the people of, we are, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So the question then becomes, how do I become a sheep? Let's say you're here this morning and you're saying, you've said sheep, you've said he was our shepherd. How do I become part of that flock? Becoming part of that flock means this, that you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You realize that you're a sinner. When you realize that you're a sinner, I just want you to understand it has nothing to do with the religion that you grew up in, the church you went to, or did not go to. Being a Christian, being a born-again believer, is accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is what makes you a Christian. Not going to First Baptist Church of Duxbury. Not going to a Catholic church. Not going to a Lutheran church. Not going to a Pentecostal church, a Word of God church. All, some of those churches are really great, but that's not what makes you a Christian. What punches your ticket to glory is to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is the only way. So, just let me show you. Let me let Jesus tell you. John chapter 10, verse 25 to 30. John chapter 10, verse 25 to 30. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you, did not, you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you did, do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Let me stop there for a second. When you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and he gives you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you are sealed. You cannot lose your salvation. You cannot. Our salvation is sealed. Again, elders, that's another Sunday school class. We are sealed in the Lord. Jesus says it right here. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them 
out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Some of you know I like to, I love history. I do a bunch of reading, strange stuff, good stuff, bad stuff. Here's a quote from a man named S.D. Gordon. He's an author and evangelist and an evangelical lay minister from the 19th century. So he was a brother going to church, working in lay ministry. Listen to what he says. This is written in the 19th century concerning biblical joy. Joy is distinctively a Christian word and a Christian thing. It is the reverse of happiness. Happiness is the result of what happens of an agreeable sort. Joy has its springs deep down inside, and that spring never runs dry, no matter what happens. Only Jesus gives that joy. He had joy, singing its music within, even under the shadow of the cross. Think about that. He picked up on Jesus on the cross had joy in the midst of dying on the cross for the sins of the world. There was joy in that for Jesus. And that's what S.D. Gordon said in the 19th century. He was an author, but he was a brother sitting in the pews, going to church, growing in Christ. Christ-centered joy is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is what characterizes the people of God. What characterizes Christians, the people of God, is the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. If you walk up to a person and the person says, well, I'm a Christian, and you ask them a couple of questions, and they don't have an answer to, then they are lost. Because every single Christian that I know can answer a couple of basic questions. I always ask, so when did you meet Jesus? And if they say, well, what do you mean? I've been going to church and, ah. I say that to a Christian, when did you meet Jesus? Man, you know, Christ saved me when I was 12. Christ saved me when I was 40 years old. Christ saved me when I was doing this. Christ came into my life when I was doing... The Holy Spirit characterizes those that are His. The Holy Spirit characterizes that. Romans 15, 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember the story of Esther? This mean man, Haman, Esther was a Jewish um, queen that became queen, if you read, you got to read Esther. Esther's a fabulous story. But near the end of Esther, right after Haman was killed, he put out an edict to try to get all the Jewish people killed. All of them. And so Esther went to the king. And you got to read the story because not, you just can't go to the king even though she was the queen. He has to put out his scepter to accept you to hear him. And he did that. And her uncle, Malachi, her uncle Malachi was there with them. And Esther told the king what the edict had done or could do, and the king gave Malachi permission to write a new edict. And there was 126 or 27 places, districts, villages, towns, where Jewish people were. And this edict allowed the Jewish people to defend themselves because the edict was to kill the entire population of the Jews. 
And so when the king gave Malachi the permission to write the edict, he wrote the edict. And when you read the scripture, there was 127 horsemen on the king's horses ready to take the edict to all the locations just in time for the people, uh, for the Jewish people to be ready to defend themselves. And they did. And one of the quotes from that is, for just as the time is this. So Esther, chapter 8, verses 17 to 18 says this. So now you know the gist of the story. I would advise you to go to Esther and read it for yourself. It is unbelievable. This, the Bible is so full of stories and intrigue and sin and all kinds of stuff. It is the best movie you could watch. Sometimes I jump into the story and literally I lose hours. I do. But you've got to read Esther. Esther chapter 8 verse 17 to 18 says this. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province, in, in, in every city, wherever the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, and feasting and celebration. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. So in my mind, I'm going, so when Christians get together and we celebrate and we have a good time and you invite non-Christians to an event and they want to know what's in the Kool-Aid and you tell them the Holy Spirit and you explain the gospel to them, that's how I relate that part of the story. That's the effect that all of you can have on the world in which you live. The world knows not and you are where you're at for a reason. No matter if you're working, if you're in school, wherever you go, as a walking, talking, born-again believer with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, everywhere you go is where you're supposed to be. And it's an open opportunity to share. I'm not talking about being in the band just like me. I'm talking about, hey, what are you doing Monday, Sunday morning at 10.30? Hey, we got a American Heritage Girls and Trail Life Boys. Ever heard of them? No. You have a daughter, right? She's like 10? Yeah. Will she be interested in this? Let me tell you what it is. That's all you have to do. And once they walk in, I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but I want you to test me on this. Invite someone who's a non-believer to something that we do. And just sit back and watch the Holy Spirit do its thing. Embrace that family. Embrace that child. So now you get the picture of now these people, they want to be Jews. Oh, happy day. Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I just shared with you that sometimes I hop into the scriptures. I wrote down the scene that I hopped into this verse. See if you can relate this to this with me. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you, I'm going to take you into my crazy mind for a second. I want you to imagine verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. I want you to imagine that you just entered the court. You are walking. You are walking, and some of you are running with me as we enter the gates with our hands held high, shouting thanksgiving, shouting praise the Lord. Unbelievable. I can't believe I'm here. Jesus, you're real. Jesus, everything is wild, and we're shouting and praising. And we're praising the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords face to face. We drop to our knees and feeling no pain as our knees hit the golden floor. 
And as we hit the golden floor, saying praises to the Lord, you know what we're praising? We are praising <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. That's going to be us in glory, guys. That's, think about that. I have to tell you, I lost about 20 minutes because my mind went crazy. Because I hit the floor, my knees didn't hurt. And as I looked down, the floor's a goal. How about that? The rest of the verse, Revelation 4, 11. You are worthy, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they are created and have their being. Christ gives a special blessing and joy to those who serve him. Did you know that? Christ gives a special blessing and a joy to those who serve him. We have lay leaders in our church all over the place. And it gets crazy. Just ask the leaders of American Heritage Girls and Trail Life Boys. Ask the leaders who work in our Helping Hands ministry. Ask the leaders of our Praise Team ministry. Ask the leaders of our, some of our deacons. Ask them. It gets crazy. But I want to let you know that those who rise up to lead in the church in whatever capacity, our Lord gives a special blessing and joy to. Luke chapter 10 Verses 17 to 20. The 72 returned with joy. Remember, this is when Jesus sent the 72 out. The 72 returned with joy. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Even the demons submitted to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Stop there for a second. You mean to tell me, Jesus, that every single walking, talking, born-again believer who's indwelt with the Holy Spirit has the power to overpower Satan? Yes, through Jesus, you do. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Let me share a really quick story that happened when I was associate pastor at, at um, Brookville Baptist Church. It's no longer called that anymore. It's called Brookville Bible Church now. And we started a ministry at a nursing home in Randolph. And I started a Bible study. And there was a demon-possessed man. I knew it when I entered the room. I felt it. The Holy Spirit just so he started to interrupt the Bible study. And I looked at him and I said, get out of here, you're not wanted here. And he looked at me and I said, move it out. And he left. The staff were blown away because they can't get him to behave. But the Lord helped me identify a demon-filled man. This scripture did not become real to me until that happened. I've read that scripture a lot because I read through the Bible every year. But that's when it was like, oh my goodness, look at God. You, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, have the authority through Christ to do the same thing. Let me finish the text. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. 
whoever, however, do not rejoice that the Spirit submitted to you, now check out this, do not rejoice that the Spirit submitted to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Every single believer that comes to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, your name is written in heaven. Now, world according to Pastor Larry, the ink is red, representing blood. Because Christ died on the cross for us. So in my crazy mind, it only makes sense if my name is written anywhere in glory, it's written in the blood of Jesus. It's not in scripture that it's in red. I just want to let you know. I said, according to Pastor Larry, my crazy mind. Please stand for your walking away thought. Here's another famous preacher that many of our older folks will remember. I love this quote from the great preacher Billy Sunday. He said this about joy. If you have no joy, there is a leak in your Christianity. If you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity. Somewhere. What about you, my brothers and sisters? Is your biblical joy leaking? Is your joy based on everything else but the person of Jesus Christ? And the words of King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 14. I have seen all things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Worldly happiness is a chasing after the wind. Worldly happiness is a chasing after the wind. You see, saints, biblical joy is a heart thing that can only last when your joy is centered on the everlasting rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rock of our salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, and I ask you that we have a clear understanding of biblical joy. That, Lord, all of us who know you and have you as our Lord and Savior, we have that joy. And I pray, Lord God, that we exercise that joy no matter what the circumstances that we face in life. Our joy is not based on worldly happiness. Our joy is based on knowing and understanding that Jesus is mine and he is, he is ours. Thank you for this opportunity, Heavenly Father. And now as we leave here this morning, I ask you, Lord God, that you continue to bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen.